this week's bulletin. Child trafficking amid Nepal's earthquake recovery. Australia's scripture classes debate heats up again. And Adventist neurosurgeon Ben Carson says he'll run for president. This is In Focus Christian News and Current Affairs. Hello, it's great to have you with us for Record In Focus this week. I'm your host, Kent Kingston, and at the news desk is the one, the only, Sir Bel Coute. We're fearfully and wonderfully made, Kent. The question is, though, which one of us is fearfully and which one is wonderfully? <laughs> Ooh, well, I think I might come off second best if I go there. So let's just quickly mention what's coming up in today's program. James Standish is in a bit later with Freedom in Focus. Not sure what his topic will be. My guess would be Ben Carson, Kent. You can take the boy out of Washington, D.C., but can you take Washington, D.C. out of the boy? Indeed. Trafford Fisher will be gracing our screens, talking about our older population. Do we still say senior citizens? So. Well, yeah. And I'll be chatting with the head of a Christian an organisation I've admired from afar for ages, and that's Habitat for Humanity. Well, that's plenty to look forward to. Let's get on with the news. Oh, yours, Sibyl. The people of Nepal are only just beginning to comprehend the scale of the devastation caused by last month's earthquake. But now they're facing a surge in another problem, child trafficking. According to Charisma News, criminal groups are capitalizing on the disaster by abducting children who are orphaned, homeless or separated from their parents. The traffickers sometimes impersonate aid workers in order to build trust. Christian NGOs working in the region say the traffickers used similar tactics after the 2004 tsunami in Southeast Asia and the Haiti earthquake. Nepal's Christian community has asked for prayer. Despite concerns over the nation's level of binge drinking, new official statistics show the average Aussie is actually drinking less. Last year, there were 9.7 litres of pure alcohol available for consumption for each person in Australia aged 15 and over. The Australian Bureau of Statistics figures show the last time the level of drinking was that low was in the early 1960s. Health leaders in the Seventh-day Adventist Church are welcoming the evidence of cultural change. Yes, of course it's a move in the right direction. Any decrease in alcohol consumption is great news. It's only a small move and we still have a massive problem with alcohol in this country. The alcohol industry is already starting to proclaim the fact that, no, we don't have a problem because alcohol consumption is re reducing. See, we're doing a great job and we need to be careful that we're not becoming complacent about the major challenge that alcohol is in this country. Another battle has erupted over scripture classes in New South Wales public schools, with critics describing some of the books used as damaging and dangerous. According to the Sydney Morning Herald, a secularist lobby group asked the State Education Department to look at a number of books that made conservative Christian statements on issues like teen sexuality, modesty, homosexuality and divorce. In response, the Education Department has ordered three particular books to be banned from special religious education classes, a decision that has caused concern and outrage. It's very worrying when a group of people start to dictate what we can teach uh, about the, the basic tenets of the Christian faith. Our worldview is not always going to be the same as the popular secular worldview, but at the same time we're called to uh, teach uh, students basically from the Bible and what the Bible has to say in a way that's age appropriate and sensitive to our context. A group of Australian Christians led by the Uniting Church is urging consumers to avoid purchasing goods produced in Israeli settlements. The Palestine-Israel Ecumenical Network says the settlements represent illegal land grabs of Palestinian territory and that a boycott is one way consumers can peacefully seek justice and show support for Palestinian Christians. Right now, the group is focusing on dates and is asking Australian businesses to ensure the brands they import are not produced by settlements. Critics of the boycott, divestiture and sanctions, or BDS movement, say it's worsening the relationship between Arabs and Jews and too often deviates into anti-Semitism. A new church-owned enterprise has launched on New South Wales' central coast with the aim of bringing healthy options to Australian tables. 
Life Health Foods is a sister company to Sanitarium and, like Sanitarium, is owned and operated by the Seventh-day Adventist Church as a not-for-profit entity. A new purpose-built facility is already producing a series of products aimed at replacing meat for consumers wanting a more plant-based diet, and managers say there's room for expansion. Because we want to prove to anyone that a plant-based lifestyle can be varied, innovative and also taste delicious. Some people that are hardcore meat eaters think that vegetarian food tastes disgusting before they've tried it. And Life Health Foods is about busting that myth. Fresh reports from both Russia and China show that their bad old days of Christian persecution are not over yet. The United States Commission on International Religious Freedom has added Russia to its watch list, with Muslims, Protestants and Jehovah's Witnesses all suffering their share of persecution. Of particular concern are the hotspots of Crimea and eastern Ukraine, where according to Mission Network News, evangelical churches have been targeted by Russian separatists. And in China, the increase in incidence of persecution against Christians has been described as alarming and possibly the worst since the Cultural Revolution of the 1960s and 70s. Last year, 400 church buildings in China were either demolished or damaged by having their crosses removed, and Christians have faced increased harassment and arbitrary arrest. After several months of hints and speculation, renowned neurosurgeon Dr. Ben Carson has formally announced that he would like to be the next president of the United States of America. Now I venture this to my family, you say, well, who are you? I'll tell you. I'm Ben Carson, and I'm a candidate for President of the United States. <laughs> Dr. Carson is believed to be the first Seventh-day Adventist to run for the presidency, although a number of Adventists have been elected to Congress previously. Church leaders in North America say they understand members are interested in this development given Dr. Carson's high profile. But, in an official statement, they stressed that church employees and property should not be involved in supporting or opposing any candidate for political office. Californian pastor Rick Warren, author of the instant Christian classic The Purpose Driven Life, has had his new Bible-based health book awarded Christian Book of the Year. Diets usually include fitness and food. The Daniel Plan also includes focus, and friendships and faith. The Daniel Plan is inspired by the biblical account of four young Jewish exiles who refused the pagan king of Babylon's wine and rich foods and discovered they were healthier on a simple diet of water and vegetables. According to the Washington Post, Pastor Warren led more than 12,000 of his church members in embracing a more holistic lifestyle that included a plant-based diet, regular exercise, and the encouragement and prayers of a small group. A key result was a combined weight loss of 118 metric tons, making the Saddleback mega church not quite so mega. And that's the news. We see it again and again, don't we, Kent? The body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, it's just so great to see, you know, people in all sorts of places just catching this vision that, you know, part of faith is the way you look after your body. Fearfully and wonderfully made, Kent. <sighs> right. <laughs> we'll take a short break now. And when we return, James Standish will be here and Sibel will not. <laughs> Signs of the Times, a magazine for a world on the brink. And this month in Signs, the Bible and its potential for problems and misunderstandings. Why being a parent gives you an advantage at work. Establishing boundaries without appearing to be selfish. Eliminating impediments to prayer and more. All in this month's Signs of the Times. Subscribe to Signs today and change your life.
welcome back. Well, as promised, James Standish is in the hot seat. So, uh, James, Sabelle said you'd be talking to us about Ben Carson today. Did she get that right? No, she did not. Uh, <laughs> she's not a prophet, is she? Uh, no, well, she is not a very good one. It was an educated guess. <laughs> <laughs> no, I thought that maybe we should talk about something that's actually happened a lot closer to home, mm -hmm. uh, that is in New South Wales, and that is the banning of a, a three books on sex education in the religious curriculum mm -hmm. in New South Wales schools. Okay, we covered this uh, briefly in the, in the news bulletin earlier, okay? So essentially, just to, to get the facts out there, uh, the Department of Education has put three books that are on the, uh, two of them which were actually on the religious uh, curriculum list for the Anglican uh, teachers, mm -hmm. and one that was never on the list, but nonetheless, uh, on a, uh, a list that uh, actually indicates that they've been barred from from usage in public schools. Okay, so so books have been banned. Ban banning books. Uh, they haven't been burnt yet, but they've <laughs> been banned. Of course, in, a, in our culture, a liberal uh, sort of democracy, learning that the government is banning books mm. is normally pretty big news, and normally the media gets right behind whoever's books has been banned, no matter what the topic is, and say, this just certainly can't be happening. But in this case, mm. well, it's been a little bit the opposite. The media, Sydney Morning Herald, etc., very happy that it's been banned. A Greens uh, uh, member of Parliament has come out and said, "Hey, this is a, this is a good thing because, you know, teachings in these books are, are damaging to vulnerable people, mm. and, vulnerable and, kids." And these are basic biblical teachings, like, "Hey, kids, maybe you should save sex until marriage." Um, you know, divorce is a, well, this you know, is can the be interesting a terrible thing. thing and hurt families. And what's well, interesting is this. And I think this is very, very key. We are living in a society where we are seeing absolute carnage with young people because of uh, sexual uh, promiscuity mm -hmm. and because of the d disintegration of families. Well, yeah, the carnage in the families too. The carnage in the families, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So you, you have those two things going on. There's no real debate over this. And there's enormous social sciences uh, research on the impact of divorce, for example, on young people. Uh, impact goes all the way through their lives because they also have a higher divorce rate themselves and all sorts of uh, negative things that you have. And of course, we have the problems that come from uh, young people having sex, everything from unwanted uh, pregnancies through to sexually transmitted transmitted diseases, but mm. just as importantly, the emotional scars and, and, and the difficulty that's happening. Now, the uh, Sydney Anglicans in this case, this was uh, their textbooks that they use uh, in their religious education that they provide to those students who opt into those classes and it has to be approved by the parents. So it's not like mm. every kid is getting this, this, this stuff. They have pointed out that not having sex before marriage has a lot of great benefits and mm. in addition that's what the Bible teaches so this this is religious education mm. that is what the Bible teaches about uh, sexual activity sure. it also happens to have tremendous uh, benefits for those who follow the biblical precedent and we have seen unquestionably tremendous pain caused by our society moving away from those ideals. And, mm. you know, when this uh, MP says, well, these biblical ideas are, are very damaging, just remember this, Ken, mm. in both the United States and Australia, since the 1950s uh, through the, the 1990s, the, the percentage or the number of, uh, of, of young people actually committing suicide tr went up 300 percent, okay, mm. in both the U.S. Boy. and and yet we're having, and this is after the sexual revolution, everything that goes on with that, mm. now we're told people who are teaching, let's come back and reconsider how sexuality is expressed mm. and there are significant spiritual and physical benefits that are banned from our schools. It's time for people to stand up and mm. take notice. Something really serious is happening mm. in the state of New South Wales and by extension Boy. in our society more not, broadly. Not, not just a different uh, difference of opinion, but very much a religious freedom issue. Absolutely. Yeah, boy. Hey, thanks for your time today, James. It's a pleasure. We'll take a short break now. Unearth ancient civilizations with archeological diggings. This bi-monthly magazine will keep you up to date with news and insights from the fascinating world of archaeology. Subscribe online or ask for archaeological diggings at your newsagent.
Welcome back to Trafford Fisher's Karaoke Hour. You got another song for us, Trafford. <laughs> <laughs> that refers, I've done it before. No, we're not going to sing today. I want to talk about old people today. Oh, you, you didn't have a Beatles song when, when I'm 64? Yeah. yeah. We, we were chatting together, weren't we, about yeah, the old, when I'm 64, will you still need me? Will you still greet me when I'm 64? Yeah, yeah. Hey, I'm nearly there. That's pretty scary. Yeah, so, so, so when we talk about looking after our, our elders and our old people, this is starting Look to get up. a bit close to it home, is, is it, Trafford? <laughs> It's getting way too close to home. Yeah. Look, I, I just, yeah, I guess, I think we need to be sensitive to our own ageism. Sure. Um, uh, you know, we can, we can, we've got to check our own feelings about how we feel about the age, and I, mm. I guess I'm moving there, so I'm a bit more sensitive to yeah. it, you're right. I've, but, I've noticed, Trafford, sometimes sitting in family gatherings, you know, there's an older person there who's perhaps a little hard of hearing, or, mm. and the conversation just happens goes very around them. goes around them yes. very fast and yeah. they just sit there and and I see that person there and I think boy that's that's yeah. a bit it sad, it, is, it, it saddens sad. me a little bit yeah. there's we all have, that experience you're right I think we have yeah. this general sense that if you're old your it's not so much contribution but your value is less in some way yeah. I think that's really sad I think you're spot on and uh, I guess if I want to share something today my concern about you know how old older people feel and and, and how can we make them feel without realising it? Mm. We can send a message to them, you don't count, you're not important. Mm. And that's a classic example. We don't talk to them directly, we talk around them. Mm. Or we shout because we assume they're deaf. Mm. Or, you know, we talk slowly and, you know, mm. as if well, you really don't understand. And I think one of the things, I remember my, my own dad uh, faced a situation where in his senior years he had to reapply for his job mm -hmm. and he made the he'd been working there as an electrician for years with this company many many years but all these younger guys were coming through with degrees but yeah. he didn't have a degree uh -huh. but he had an incredible and he said some of these guys with degrees had no idea in the real <laughs> world yeah. but he had to stand against these guys who had degrees and so we you know i think a lot of age people well, i don't have a degree so i don't count but they've got the incredible wisdom and years of knowledge yeah, experience, it's interesting. Yeah. The, the christian text i love it i've got to share these two it says cast me not aside when i grow old as my strength fails do not forsake me wow where's, where's that from that's in psalms okay. So David is an older man saying, hey, count me in, I'm still there. Yeah. And then another one in, the, in Leviticus says, stand in the presence of grey hair and give respect to the elderly. Yay. Oh, amen. So I think there's yeah. some ways we can do that. Be sensitive to how we feel, our own feelings about aged people. Don't talk around them, talk to them. Mm. Don't assume that they're deaf or incapable of doing things. Oh, one of my favourite photos that I saw from a Time magazine yeah. was a guy who's water skiing and he's 100 years old. Wow. Yes, he's my hero. You know, yeah. People can do incredible things and of course we are living longer now. Mm -hmm. Our medical world, we're making improvements. So, so we're going to have more and more aged people in our society in Australia over the years ahead. So I think we need to be really sensitive to this. Take care of them look after them, honour them well. Wow, that's great. Look after and, me and, and <laughs> honour me well. <laughs> honour me well. <laughs> and, and, and if you are an older person, don't be afraid to pull rank now again. You know, I was doing that when you were still in nappies. You know, It's a good line. Yeah, do yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> Stand up for what's good. Thanks so Thank much, Trafford. Can. Really good appreciate night. you being oh, yeah. here for us. No worries. We'll see you straight after the break. Thousands of years ago, a series of ancient prophecies were disguised within a system of mysterious symbols. For centuries, these remarkable predictions have been sealed to the world until now. Check out our new Secrets of Prophecy online course today in 24 beautifully illustrated free studies at www.itiswrittenoceania.tv or call 1-300-300-389 for your free copy today. Hi, welcome back. Well, it was only just a year or so ago that the 50% mark was passed of people who now live in cities around the world. And uh, Martin Thomas from Habitat Humanity is here to tell us that I guess a lot of that housing in those cities is not particularly 
safe or...? Um... No, look, it's incredibly inadequate when you think of it. I mean, it is a phenomenal figure. I think that was a UN figure you mentioned back in 2007, the first time in the history of human settlement that there's more people in cities than in rural areas. And if you think, uh, you know, if you might have seen Slumdog Millionaire, yeah. these slums that just pan out forever. Mm. Um, no safety, no, uh, police often don't go in there, often no clean water, uh, near railway tracks, all sorts of dangers. Mm. And there's something like 500 million people just in Asia alone that live in those wow. conditions. Kids, you know, men, women, mm. and uh, you know, slums in some cases can be quite functional. You can get your hair cut and you can do different things, mm. but in other cases they can be violent places. They can mm. be places where there's disease, where kids don't get to go to school. So it's an incredible mass of humanity that's wow. in um, you know, in huge dire need. Do we have any idea of the proportion of the world's? Uh, population that is living in you know slum or slum like conditions well I think it's around about one to two billion people um, and when we think of a population of seven billion wow. um, it's a, it's a fair proportion the problem is it's growing and mm. uh, for instance in Asia alone I mentioned 500 million um, that figure is set to go to close to 900 million mm. so it's it's happening at such a rapid pace yeah when you look at um, at a macro level with the figures, they're horrifying. But when you mm. look at one individual life, uh, you know, I was in Cambodia recently and just walking down the slums, the, the smell of a slum, mm. there's gangrenous green water all around the place. Mm. You see people brushing their teeth. The everyday life Ooh. happens. Yeah. Um, there's rubbish everywhere. And, you know, in many of these places, there's no organised rubbish collection. So Habitat for Humanity focuses on on building houses, doesn't it? Look, it does. There's a couple of, I guess there's kind of two or three key pillars to what we do. We, we do look at trying to get a safe, de decent housing for everyone, no matter you know, how poor we believe everyone has a right, because we believe that's the start of breaking the poverty cycle. Obviously, when someone is starving or has disease, you need to have a, a full-on response to that, and organisations like UNICEF and World Vision do that tremendously. Sure. But at some stage, to get independence, you need to give people a safe, decent place to live. Mm -hmm. They've got warmth, they've got light, they have an opportunity for their kids to go to school. So we think it all starts with the home when you're trying to break the poverty cycle. Okay, so it's, does Habitat for Humanity in Australia focus on particular countries? I mean, you mentioned Asia a few times. Is Asia yeah. your focus? So from an Australian point of view, yeah, our, our office and the supporters that support Habitat Australia um, support uh, programs in seven countries across Asia. Mm -hmm. uh, and some of the booming countries you mentioned, so Bangladesh, Dakar, mm -hmm. uh, we're in Cambodia, we're in Vietnam, we're in Thailand. So basically some of the biggest growth areas um, mm. with this issue of urbanisation um, we're looking to tackle. Okay. Yeah. And are you building houses within the slums or are you looking to help people move out of slums to establish something maybe in a more legal area where there's a yeah. bit more stability? Look, we're doing both because of the sheer numbers. We're looking at trying to, it seems odd, but there's a phrase called slum upgrading. But we're trying oh, okay. to look at, let, there's a mass of humanity there. You can't move them all out. Let's look at ways to basically get better conditions in there. So you're not just building individual houses. Are you working with that some infrastructure right. stuff as well? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, we do broad-based community development. We kind of start with a house, but the idea that if you don't have clean water, a house is not much good for you. So we work True. sometimes with other organisations, sometimes ourselves, to do water and sanitation, looking at other things in terms of access to school, etc. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Now, Habitat uses a, a unique phrase that I don't think I've heard any other organisation use, and that's sweat equity. Yeah. Well, what does that mean? Yeah, well, look, essentially, we talked about houses being a key pillar for us. The other is the involvement of volunteering. Mm -hmm. So for an individual family that would be benefited from a house, um, we expect them to put in to have a bit of ownership. Uh, we kind of mm -hmm. say, as a lot of charities do, that it's a hand up, not a hand out. Yep. So we would require them to do 500 hours of sweat equity. So volunteering on their house in any way they can. Mm. And we also... Um, so, so people help to build their own houses. Absolutely, yeah. And then we actually have volunteers that are willing to go. So in Australia, we send about 500 volunteers a year overseas to these countries. Mm -hmm. And they will work next to a householder and next to local craftsmen who won't speak the language. And for yep. five days, you'll be hammering nails, you'll be digging trenches. Wow. Um, and on the fifth or sixth day, sounds quite biblical on the sixth day, yeah. um, <laughs> you get to hand over a key to a family and you see wow. the difference it makes. And um, although it, uh, you kind of think, well, there's so many people, what difference does that make? We had a group go to Nepal recently, a group of women, and they said every day they'd go from their hotel, because we, we don't make people camp out, so they stay in a cheap hotel, yeah. they'd go to the site and they'd help build, and they said every day the uh, community would just watch them and wouldn't help, and they kind of um, thought, what's happening here? Mm. Um, and slowly the community started to get involved, but on the day of the handover, one of the community elders uh, stood up and said, 
Look, we are really challenged because this was a, a woman you were helping, a, a widow, uh, who wasn't very high in our society, wasn't really um, someone which, which we would respect. Mm. Um, but the fact that you've spent all your time to come over and help this woman has really humbled us. And we're going to make wow. sure that we keep that house maintained for her and we provide support for her because you've really shown us something. It sounds like a very Christ-like thing to do, really, not in preaching necessarily, but through an example, because Habitat is a Christian organisation. Yeah, that? it is, definitely. And look, the story is quite amazing. It was... Um, um, started 40 years ago. Millard Fuller was an American. He was a, a US marketing executive who was a millionaire, had his own company at about 29. But his life was miserable. His marriage was on the rocks. Um, he was working too hard. And essentially they came to a crisis and his wife said, unless you sell the company, give the money to the poor, um, I'm we're not going to continue with this marriage. Wow. Um, I haven't told my wife this story yet. <laughs> but uh, so he made the decision and they went, um, sold their company, gave everything they had, went and volunteered in um, uh, southern states of America, helping uh, black communities get housing and mm -hmm. ended up in the Congo wow. in Zaire. Well, Zaire as it was then. But he started something um, just through that unselfish act. When mm. you think that Habitat is huge across the world, every four minutes somewhere yeah. in the world, Habitat either builds, repairs, pairs or renovates a house and it was wow. from that one man that minutes. made a sacrifice. That's yeah, it's incredible. incredible. So um, how has working with Habitat impacted you spiritually? I think to try to do something that makes a difference um, is really my personal journey and I'm mm. probably more head than heart. Um, mm. You know, I don't find it easy kind of um, uh, putting myself outside my comfort zone. Some people love to. But uh, I think for me, um, the, there's no moral divide between someone that's in need right in front of you. If yeah. you see a kid get knocked down, you'd go and, and help them yeah. versus someone who's a world away. And yeah. the fact is we can make a huge difference to people um, who we may never meet mm. or we may only meet in heaven. Yeah. But there's a sense that we can do something and sometimes it might be a few dollars, sometimes it might be volunteering. So yeah. in all sorts of ways, no matter how much uh, resources or time you have, you can engage doesn't even have to be through Habitat, but I think for an organisation, or for a Christian, sorry, to do something so that when you stand in front of your Creator, you can say, well, at least I did something. Mm, wow. Boy, look, there's so much I, I could ask you about. I'd like to ask you about, you know, the Vanuatu rebuilding program. Yeah. That's a, you know, a big thing right now after the cyclone hit there, Australia's domestic building program. Yeah. Um, if people want to find out more about that or they want to, you know, help you guys out, you know, volunteer, go on a trip, have you got a website that... We do, yeah, habitat.org.au, um, all the details there. Um, yeah, and there's a lot on there, as you can imagine. Hey, thank you so much. I really appreciate your time, Martin Thomas. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. We'll see you after the break. Planning your future can be a daunting task. What you want to do, who you want to be, and the road ahead can often be unpredictable. No one really knows what the future holds. That's just part of what makes it all so amazing. And that's why a great education matters. Because it doesn't just help you get a great job. It helps you prepare for what life can throw at you and live a great life. Avondale. It's education designed for life. Hello. Well, that's all from us for this week. If you missed some of today's program or you'd like to take another look at one of our segments, all the videos are online for you to watch and share with your friends. And our web address hasn't changed, record.net.au. All the best to you and your family. We'll see you next time on Record in Focus. God bless. Thank you.